The image we see here holds a relatively brief story, one that, if not for a stationary camera capturing the moment, would likely have gone unbelieved. To put it into context, we need to go back to Peru, specifically to the port city of Chimbote, in the year 1999. The woman in the image is none other than Senora Marilita Quisp, a well-known tarot reader and psychic from the Peruvian coast, who worked itinerantly from the 1980s until the late 1990s. Known for being one of the most prominent women in the world of Santeria, she was highly respected by both mestizo and indigenous communities in the South American country. Her work, centered around Santeria and tarot-based fortune-telling, sparked great fervor. But to truly grasp her significance, it's important to understand that Santeria, originally developed in the Caribbean under African and Spanish influences, arrived in Peru through the diaspora, though it didn't gain the prominence it did in Brazil. The syncretism between Catholic, indigenous, and African traditions in Peru certainly makes it a key factor when studying the country's dominant cosmology. When it comes to the art of fortune-telling, its significance is considerable in the daily lives of many Peruvians. This practice is predominantly carried out by women who are consulted on a variety of matters ranging from love and health to luck and financial well-being. The well-known witches of the Andean world are an essential part of how people interact through intermediaries, whether to secure good luck in gambling, love, or even to harm others. Marilita de Quispe, born in a poor neighborhood in Lima, led a complex and tragedy-filled life. Her parents passed away when she was only seven years old, and she witnessed the deaths of her two brothers at the hands of a terrorist group. However, endowed with an enviable resilience, she worked tirelessly both on herself and for others. From a young age, she took on cleaning jobs in homes, kitchens, and anywhere she could earn a bit of money. In all these places, both her employers and co-workers were astonished by the remarkable wisdom of this young girl. It was said that she could see into a person's soul through their eyes, that she could understand the deepest struggles of men just by knowing their name and age. Aware that she had been given a gift, she devoted herself to the art of fortune-telling and various transhumanist practices. By the time she was 17, she was already widely known as a remarkable psychic and healer. Her work in rural communities and impoverished neighborhoods earned her a fortune, thanks to the countless gifts and donations from her grateful clients. She continued in this way for about 20 years, until an accident in 2002 forced her to completely withdraw from her practice. Marilla de Quispa who often recorded her sessions on camera to prove herself to the skeptics who called her a fraud, encountered a curious case in Chimbo. Many believed it to be a case of demonic possession. Merlita asked the woman in question, Laura Huaman, to visit her shop. After a long conversation, the psychic, despite evident resistance from the young woman, confirmed that she might be in contact with one of the Manala Supa creatures. In Peruvian mythology, specifically in Can, ever since the arrival of the Spanish to the Americas, religious letters began to mention peculiar creatures that greatly resembled angels. However, these beings shared complex traits that made them difficult to classify. They were entities that eluded both Incan and Catholic understanding. These creatures often manifested only in dreams and rarely appeared to those nearing death. Possessions attributed to these entities were, until that point, extremely rare as the symptoms displayed by the supposed possessed bore no resemblance to the more frequent and well-known cases. The most notable characteristic was the translucent skin on the limbs and glowing eyes in the dark, as well as the knowledge of future events that would inevitably come to pass. Marilla de Quispe requested proof from the Manala Supa entity, and after several minutes of insistence, relying on her powers, skill, and experience, she finally received a response. The entity lifted her into the air inside her shop, and, after a few seconds, dropped her onto the sofa seen in the background. Following this experience, the woman claimed that every night, translucent beings visited her, revealing horrific future events. 
In fact, in her last interview with a Peruvian radio station, she confessed that her retirement was prompted by that night when these entities began revealing the death dates of her closest loved ones, including her own. Witches in Russia have been an integral part of folklore and popular culture for centuries, deeply connected to pre-Christian Slavic beliefs. In ancient Russia, witches were seen as powerful figures who could both heal and harm, depending on their intentions and how society perceived their practices. In Slavic mythology, witches were often linked to nature and the elements. They were known for their ability to control the weather, cast spells, and use plants to create magical or healing potions. It could even be said that they held a certain status as wise women and were some of the only healers in the realm of ancient medicine. However, the primarily Mongolian roots that witches and healers in Russia have inherited give them a complexity that is difficult to grasp within the Christian Western world. This syncretism between Catholicism, Slavic paganism, and the ancient deities of Deep Asia turned the figure of the witch into a kind of entity capable of contacting different planes of reality, as well as possessing supernatural powers. In Siberian territories, these figures are often surrounded by an aura of mystery and secrecy. The deeper one ventures into the forests and steppes of Russia, the more these witches seem to diverge from the Western archetype becoming cryptic figures whose characteristics abandon any concept of what we might consider human. In the distant village of Novo Beryliusi, deep in the heart of the Krasnoyarsk Krai region, it has been passed down through generations that the residence of the only witch we might consider real could be found. Real in the sense that the stories surrounding her figure go beyond vague and folkloric descriptions, having been recorded as actual testimonies and evidence of peculiar occurrences in the depths of the frozen forest. In 2018, on the subreddit A Normal Day in Russia, a user shared this photograph taken during their vacation in Novo Beryliusi, along with the story of their casual experience. It was an autumn night. Daylight was becoming increasingly scarce, something that was quickly noticeable as the weeks went by. It was the first time in my life I had ever left my hometown of Omsk. At 18 years old, this was my first vacation away from home, and I had the chance to stay with my uncle, his wife, and their two young children on their huge estate near Novo Beryliusi. The first few days were amazing, and I learned a lot about the region's history and traditions. You would be surprised those who live in the big cities of the West at the sheer number of myths that people here know and how they seem to be part of everyday life. My uncle and aunt told me that during the autumn nights, as winter drew closer, many of the villagers claimed to have seen the witch. They simply called her that. Maybe the word witch was some sort of euphemism because what they described was more like an anthropomorphic creature that clumsily hunted from the woods. Naturally, I didn't believe any of those stories, because, in reality, much of what they told were just mythological explanations for phenomena they didn't quite understand. One of those many beautiful sunsets, we took my uncle's old truck out for a ride with my younger cousins. Since I wasn't familiar with the area, and as expected, I ended up getting lost at some point, which meant we had to head back after dark. Fortunately, my phone's GPS didn't fail much, nor did the signal so I was able to call my uncle to let him know everything was fine. However, the truck broke down about three kilometers from the house, so we had to wait for them to come get us. I never found out exactly where in the village we got stranded, but there was nothing around us except flat fields, trees that had already lost their leaves, and off to the side of the road, a small cabin with its door wide open. While waiting for my uncle, our curiosity got the better of us, and we approached the cabin, assuming it was abandoned. Yet inside, as you can see in the photograph, despite the grime, there was a perfectly maintained bed, and above it, a row of eerie rag dolls. At that moment, we didn't know what to think. We began to freeze up from how eerie the scene was. There was a good chance that someone actually lived there, even in such conditions. What happened shortly after, I'll never truly understand. 
just as my uncle arrived in one of his neighbor's cars. Or maybe it happened a little before. We heard a strange moan coming from one of the rooms. It sounded like a deep yet high-pitched voice, like that of a huge sick woman. It was bizarre, because I could never be sure if it was really something supernatural or just some noise the car made as it pulled up. However, to my uncle and his neighbor, that moan was the voice of the witch, the one you could come across anywhere remote and silent. The Ordovician Silurian mass extinction, which occurred approximately 443 million years ago, is considered one of the five major extinction events in geological history. This event marked the end of the Ordovician era, defining the boundary with the Silurian, and led to the extinction of around 85% of marine species, as life at that time was predominantly ocean-based. The causes of this extinction are linked to a series of global climate changes, particularly the dramatic cooling that triggered widespread glaciation on the supercontinent Gondwana, located in the southern hemisphere. This cooling caused a significant drop in sea levels, which greatly reduced coastal marine habitats, where much of the life of that era thrived. As the glaciers advanced and retreated, sea levels fluctuated, disrupting ocean circulation patterns and consequently affecting the distribution of nutrients and dissolved oxygen in marine water. These changes contributed to episodes of anoxia, lack of oxygen, in the deep oceans, increasing mortality rates among species most sensitive to environmental changes. However, those climatic changes, for which many causes have been theorized, have never definitively confirmed the involvement of a species that, by all accounts, appears to be the true culprit. This hypothesis suggests that, under certain climatic conditions unique to that moment in the planet's history, a type of parasitic algae proliferated uncontrollably across much of the ocean. This algae, whose role in the ecosystem was simply to break down and recycle organic waste, spiraled out of control. In a relatively short time, about 70% of the marine surface had been overtaken by masses of this algae. The problem was that, even in natural conditions deep below the surface, the algae consumed far more oxygen than usual. When exposed to air, its activity increased significantly. It's believed that this algal plague depleted the planet's oxygen supply, wiping out nearly every living species and eventually collapsing on itself after several years due to the strain of the global anoxia it had triggered. Classified as Adia constricta, this algae was first studied in 1996 in the depths off the Pacific coast of Colombia. It wasn't until 2017 that a Canadian study, along with reports from local fishermen, identified a mass of the same algae emerging to the ocean surface and becoming stagnant in the natural Gorgona National Park. Researchers observed this phenomenon with concern, as studying this algae had previously been challenging due to its inaccessible habitat. However, reports from 2017 to the present indicate that this type of algae has not only begun to appear along the Colombian coast, but also along the shores of Mexico, California, and even in certain southern regions of the Japanese archipelago. In the northernmost region of Nicaragua, in Central America, lies the area known as Costa Cari Norte. This region is the most isolated in the country, covered by over 90% unexplored jungle, making it the least developed area with the highest levels of poverty and rurality. The northern coast of Nicaragua is also a protected UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's not just the extreme difficulty of penetrating the dense jungle that hinders community progress. Legal protections prevent some expeditions from entering with any degree of ease. Preliminary archaeological and historical studies suggest that this region holds countless material remains from ancient civilizations. It is estimated that there could be around eight pyramids and a hundred entrances to deep caves. 
Both are attributed to the extinct civilization of the Lok Che, of whom we have only references from other pre-Columbian tribes. The Lok Che were said to be highly knowledgeable about their natural surroundings. They mastered the art of camouflage, and despite having built enormous pyramids, they chose to keep them hidden. This means that today, these structures would be surrounded by ancient trees, many of which are still surviving from that time, dating back to 900. In 2014, a group of Nicaraguan and Mexican researchers, after initiating processes with the Ministry of Culture since 2009, finally received approval, after 20 years, to enter the prohibited areas of the northern coast. After nearly two decades without authorized explorations, the ministry granted access for a period of two weeks under the supervision of the National Heritage Committee to no more than five kilometers west of the base point. Unfortunately, during those 14 days, they were unable to find any evidence of the pyramids for two significant reasons. First, much of the area was covered by protected species of shrubs and trees, making it impossible to forge a path. Second, the density of an untouched jungle severely slowed down any attempts to move in large groups. However, while following the course of the Yonada River, they discovered one of the many caves, and to everyone's surprise, they did not have to venture far inside to encounter this imposing sculpture. With a serpentine appearance and a height of nearly 17 meters, the explorers encountered the statue less than 10 minutes after entering. According to the few records available for the area, it was known that the Tilo Ketixi were characterized by their worship of large anthropomorphic entities, many resembling gigantic serpents and various insects. Due to the difficulty of handling any material of invaluable archaeological significance, they could only take a couple of photographs, risking damage to artifacts that had remained in complete darkness for nearly a thousand years due to the lights and flashes. To this day, documents have been signed to ensure that in 2025, they can return to the Yulnada River and explore the caves in greater detail, all managed by the National Autonomous University of Nicaragua.